Go on to PCOS, to GDM, to type 2 diabetes. This is a continuum. As you can see, it starts with loading the gun where the genes are faulty or adverse. And then on top of that, you have an adverse lifestyle, increased calorie, decreased activity, giving rise to obesity, insulin resistance, early menarche, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and, pregnant, uh, and gestational diabetes, pre-diabetes, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So now we will start at the center of this continuum, which is inevitable if if left untreated. Polycystic ovarian disease is a heterogeneous condition. It, is, uh, pre it presents with reproductive, endocrine, metabolic, and psychosocial symptoms, and it has a huge impact on the quality of life. And there are two hormones that are key in the understanding of PCOS. One is androgen, and second is insulin, and how the body's response to its elevation can give rise to the signs and symptoms and this disorder. So we have studies in India. One was done in Mumbai. It was an OPD setting in 778 girls, including the USG. And they found that the prevalence of PCOS is 22.5 by the Rotterdam criteria and 10.7 by the Androgen Excess Society criteria. Another study uh, done by Ramnidhi and all shows that the prevalence of PCOS in Indian adolescent is 9.13. And this draws attention to the issue of early diagnosis in adolescent girls. The prevalence of uh, PCOS worldwide is from anywhere between 5 to 15 percent. So how, how do we recognize this? When should we be alerted? It should be considered in any adolescent girl with hirsutism or treatment resistant acne or menstrual irregularity or infertility or acanthosis nigricans. See, most of these patients actually do not come to us with all these symptoms. They go to the dermatologist, they go to the gynecologist, and they may come to us for evaluation of obesity. And when we see the signs of acanthosis, we have to find the signs and symptoms of PCOS and diagnosing early will go in a long way in the management of these patients. What are the diagnostic criteria for PCOS? NIH in 1990, that was an old classification. We have the Rotterdam classification in 2003, where any two out of three of these should be present to make a diagnosis. One is chronic oligoanovulation. Second is hyperandrogenism. And third is polycystic ovarian morphology changes. But in 2006, the Androgen Excess Society has made it mandatory that we must see hyperandrogenism androgenism, and then out of the other two, one is enough along with hyperandrogenism to make a diagnosis of PCOS. But at all times, we must exclude secondary causes like thyroid dysfunction, hyperprolactinemia, non-classic CH, adrenal ovarian tumors, Cushing syndrome, or acromegaly. So here we have a picture of hyperandrogenism. You see acne there, which are resistant to treatment. You have thick, dark, terminal hair on the chest, chin, upper lip, abdomen, and thigh. And you can see the ferrimin Galway score here, um, seen uh, excess hair in all these regions. You have to have at least eight uh, positive to make a authentic diagnosis of hirsutism and then a male pattern hair loss. All these are features of increased androgens. You might also see biochemically increased levels of androgens more than 6 to 86 nanograms per deciliter. And then what is oligoanovulation? It is less than eight menstruations per year or more than two cycles of less than 22 or more than 42 days per year. And polycystic ovarian morphology, 12 or more follicles, 2 to 9 millimeters per ovary, or an ovarian volume more than 10 ml in the absence of a dominant follicle. So you see it is already a heritable disease. As I told you, 70% of PCOS is heritable. And in addition to that, there's a later on postnatal provocative hit in the form of insulin resistant hyperinsulinemia as occurs in metabolic syndrome and postnatal obesity. And also puberty can be a hit. It is at this time that we start seeing the signs and symptoms of PCOS. And most of them who come to us are adolescent. 
what is the cause what are the drivers you see it happens in various tissues the, there's an increased gn gnrh pulse which increases the lh pulse frequency from the pituitary gland increasing the ratio of lh to fsh and we know that low fsh will arrest the follicles in the follicular stage and will prevent ovulation from happening and will prevent the corpus luteum from forming and that's what forms the follicles in the ovary in the ovarian compartment synthesis of androgens by ovary due to defect in the cyp17 gene with defective aromatization of androgen to estrogen and stimulation of the theca cells by high lh and insulin like growth factor an adrenaline compartment ad adrenal compartment there is secretion of androgens due to again defect to uh, c uh, cyp17 gene now it can present throughout the life span and we get uh, patients at all ages you might see a premature uh, menarche you might see an adolescent with pcos finally going into gdm infertility type 2 diabetes or you might see them in the later years with cardiovascular disease or endometrial carcinoma there is a link there is a link between pcos insulin resistance gdm and type 2 diabetes so on the one hand there is a genetic predisposition to excess ovarian androgen secretion giving rise to large polycystic ovaries on the other hand there is a genetic and dietary factors which influence insulin secretion or access and then the influence on the pituitary all these together the insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia the increased lh levels finally give rise to the symptoms of anovulation and hirsutism but secondary to increase in the testosterone levels at the same time hyperinsulinemia will also have its effect on the liver it decreases the sex hormone binding globulin and therefore gives rise to free testosterone level which further aggravate hirsutism and then there's an epidemiological link so pcod increases the risk of gdm by 200% it increases the risk of type 2 diabetes by 1600% insulin resistance is present in almost 80 to 90% of the pcod cases and 60% of gdm patients develop type 2 diabetes this do see insulin resistance in pcos and this was a study where they took obese pco as patients and compared them with obese normal and you can see the decrease almost uh, 6 uh, 40% decrease in the insulin sensitivity and then they took normal pco normal obese pcos patients and normal obese normal people and you can still see a 30% decrease in the insulin sensitivity suggesting that insulin resistance is present in pcos there's also the prevalence of diabetes in pcos people uh, pcos women have an increased risk of glucose tolerance and type 2 diabetes even when we diagnose a pcs at least half of them will have impaired glucose tolerance and at least 15% of them will have type 2 diabetes so it is this hormonal imbalance that is aggravated by metabolic impairment that is a huge challenge for ovulation and fertility and most of these patients go to the gynecologist and you will see the rising incidence of prevalence of assisted fertility technologies that are required because 85% of female infertility is secondary to pcos and that is really alarming GDM is actually type 2 diabetes triggered by pregnancy we know we have glucose intolerance that appears or is recognized for the first time during pregnancy is GDM the two are closely associated insulin resistance is common to both GDM and type 2 diabetes there is a nexus between the two women diagnosed with PCS have a 2.4 fold increase odds of GDM independent of age race ethnicity and multiple gestation you see the prevalence of gdm is so high in india it is 27.6% 6.2 million live births are affected by hyperglycemia in pregnancy of which 5.9 million are due to gdm 
And this Tamil Nadu field study has shown that in the urban areas, the incidence of GDM is very high, 17.8% compared to the semi-urban areas, 13.8% and rural areas, 9.9%. Even in the rural areas, GDM is high. The thing is that GDM, PCOD, type 2 diabetes are all heritable. And if you see a family history of type 2 diabetes is a known risk factor for uh, GDM. Girls born to PCOD mothers are at increased risk of PCOD in adulthood. And daughters and sisters of women with PCOD had high levels of adrenal and ovarian androgens from adolescent to adulthood. So not only that, GDM, PCOD, and type 2 diabetes have similar impact on the placenta, as you just heard from Shalini. There's villous immaturity, there's choreoagiosis, ischemic ischemia, there's villous necrosis, there are nucleated RBDs, all have an impact on the pregnancy. And this you can see a meta-analysis of pregnancy outcomes in women with PCOS, the incidence of gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, cesarean delivery, and prematurity are high. The odds ratio are more than one. Even the NICU admission and the perinatal mortality are very high, the odds ratio being two and three, which, uh, which is pretty high. And also the implications of GDM have adverse maternal outcomes, and adverse neonatal outcomes. Shalini just told you all this, so I'm not going to repeat. But what I want to highlight is that maternal diabetes has also been linked to offspring that develop obesity, diabetes, and also neurodegenerative and psychiatric diseases, as well as low intellectual and verbal coefficient, language problems, motor in Payments, attention deficit syndrome, hyperactivity disorders, and a lot of problems with psychosocial development, which we are going to see much later after they're born or even after they uh, cross five years. And there's also a risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It is difficult to nip GDM when it's developing. The later you diagnose it, the more are the rates of perinatal mortality, neonatal hypoglycemia, preterm deliveries. The earlier is the initiation of treatment, better are the outcomes. There are low rates of macrosomia, large for gestational age uh, infants. As high as 80% of GDM patients have impaired OGTT right at the first trimester. And therefore, screening at the second trimester, we might miss out on our GDM patients. Um, this is David Barker's uh, fetal and infant origins of adult disease. We know that underfeeding and overfeeding during pregnancy may lead to different pathophysiological mechanisms to insulin deficiency and type 2 diabetes in later life. Just take one scenario where the, when the mothers are overfed or, or there is hyperglycemia, the programming is for overproduction, fetal pancreas secretes higher than normal insulin. This leads to early beta cell exhaustion. And finally, uh, in the children, when insulin requirement rises, pancreas fail to reciprocate. So you see type 2 diabetes and GDM in the offspring. On the other hand, underfed state where there's maternal starvation, you see there's programming for underproduction, the fetal pancreas produces less insulin. So the fetal pancreas production capacity gets compromised. And later on, when insulin requirement rises, the pancreas fails to reciprocate. So you get future type 2 diabetes and GDM. So type 2 diabetes is inevitable after GDM. There's a threefold increase or uh, risk of type 2 diabetes in the GDM mothers. The yearly conversion is 2 to 3%. There's also a risk of the metabolic syndrome in women with previous GDM, three times adjusted for age and BMI. But importantly, the vasculature of women with a prior case of GDM is permanently altered. And this predisposes them to cardiovascular disease in later life. This is a WINGS database. And they wanted to see uh, the uh, amount of glucose intolerance over one year. And you'll be surprised that out of five women, one develops glucose intolerance within one year. This was done at the Chennai Research Diabetes Center along with the IDF. So in the first year itself, 
20 percent uh, women become type 2 diabetic. And further studies by Dr. Yagnik and Dr. Gatuvi have shown that Indians develop type 2 diabetes after developing gel pretty early compared to the Western counterparts within five years. And that is very alarming. Even the Denmark study where they looked at women six years after pregnancy of, uh, who had GDM, uh, you see 18% developed diabetes, 17% had pre-diabetes. And when they followed up this women 30 years later, 30, a total of 19 years, only a third had normal glucose tolerance out of 151 participants. Another study of 330 women, 41 had diabetes, 26 had pre-diabetes. So you can see that Type 2 diabetes is inevitable. And this is the risk of GDM in future, future pregnancies. So once a mother has diabetes, and if she has a, the next pregnancy, she has a 50% chance of getting GDM uh, in the next pregnancy. Now, um, it's not only type 2 diabetes and GDM and, and these comorbidities. There are other comorbidities as well with PCOS, uh, which... I think which are not talked about much, obstructive sleep apnea is a, is a complication of PCOS, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is a forerunner of type 2 diabetes when, when the type 2 diabetes is brought pretty early. It's a risk factor for heart disease. And then you have um, depression and anxiety, and they often tend to forget the, the psychological aspects of PCOS and then endometrial carcinoma as well, besides the um, insulin resistance syndrome. And then in short, I'm just going to show you three more slides on treatment methods. This, so uh, in PCOS treatment, this is a summary. Women who don't want to get pregnant and women who do want to get pregnant, we divide these. Those who don't want to get pregnant, contra uh, combined oral contraception is the drug of choice. It helps treat menstrual irregularities, acne, hirsutism, reduces the risk of endometrial cancer and hyperplasia. In those who have hyperandrogenism, finasteride, spironolactone, and um, GnRH agonists are used. For those women who want to get pregnant, metformin is a treatment of child. They may have altered glucose tolerance. They, it helps regulate the menstrual cycles, treat the glycemia, and also achieve weight uh, loss. And those um, in infertility, we uh, can give clomiphene, citrate, and letrozole as an, and as an adjunct treatment. Metformin can be given to these patients. But of course, you have to customize the treatment to every patient and uh, Follow the lifestyle modification, decrease the calorie intake and exercise, smoking cessation. All these are very important for weight loss, which will decrease the insulin resistance and also the signs symptoms of PCS and the androgen levels. In GDM, we know that um, this, I think Shalini already spoke, the pre-pregnancy, but um, universal screening is um, necessary to curb this epidemic. And we know that the DIPSI guidelines tells us that we should do is the single step OGTT. So I'll not speak about this, but we need to educate the patient, uh, manage early, look, uh, prevent the steps for future deterioration and make a part, part of routine assessment of women um, to curb the incidence of gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes. This is the national guidelines by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So you see if the two RPG is more than 140, you have to repeat the test after 24 to 28 weeks. If it is negative, you manage as normal. If it's positive, manage as GDM. And this is my last slide uh, where the standard of medical care in diabetes 2020, American Diabetes Association, which says that insulin is the preferred treatment for GDM. Metformin should not be used as first line agent because it crosses the placenta to the fetus. Metformin, when used to treat PCOS and induce ovulation, should be discontinued by the end of the first trimester. So thank you very much. And I'm open to questions.